Hi everyone, it's Jennifer Van Alstein. I'm here with Dr. Jennifer Polk, and we're gonna be talking about informational interviews today. Now you might recognize Jennifer from a live conversation that we had last year about networking. I'm definitely gonna to link to that, but this one is one you don't wanna miss. Be sure to hit that like and subscribe button. Dr. Jennifer Polk, I'm so excited that you're here to talk with me. Would you mind introducing yourself for everyone? Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me. So feel free to call me Jen, everyone. <laughs> Dr. Polk, if you want to be formal, <laughs> but Jen is perfectly fine. Um, so the, the short version is that I help PhDs get clear on their career path so they can confidently market themselves for jobs they actually want. Uh, typically, that means outside of academia, but I've worked with everyone on all the things. Uh, I have a PhD myself in history. I got that 10 years ago. And these days I'm self-employed and uh, it's, it's cool. It's good work to be able to help people like figure out what's next and get there. It's very empowering. Oh, that's great. Thanks for sharing that with me. Now, I know that it's really hard to kind of imagine what life might like be outside of the academy for many professors who've been in for a long time, but also for graduate students who are going through and really trying to figure out what their next steps are. So it's something that's affecting everyone, no matter where you are in your academic career, there may be a good opportunity for you outside of academia. Jen is someone that can help with that. Now, there's another way that people can learn more about jobs outside of academia, and that's through informational interviews, but that's kind of like a jargony word. I mean, what is an informational interview? Yeah, so that was a great prompt. <laughs> yes, <laughs> check marks to all of what you said. Uh, totally. So informational interviews. So first off, if you haven't heard this term before, it might sound very strange. <laughs> it's not It's not very elo eloquent, right? But just know that it is a super common term. Uh, so even if you haven't come across it before, it's really common. And it's not just like corporate. It's common everywhere. Um, and all it means is having a conversation with somebody who works in a job, a field, for an employer or ha who has in the past that interests you. Uh, and it, the specifics of that conversation depends on what you want to learn, right? So this is a learning experience. Um, sometimes people get the idea that this form of networking, so yeah, informational interview, I, it is a form of networking, um, but it's not really about you in fact, it is not about you pitching your services or you asking for a job. Uh, it's, it's a learning experience. I also uh, want to emphasize that it is a community building experience. Do you want to be in community with this person and people like them? Uh, so, yeah, that's a short answer to what that is. Just just conversating with somebody else. I love that. And I think that so many people have like a fear or anxiety about informational interviews. And maybe that's because they don't know what it is. It sounds like an info interview is a conversation you have with someone to learn more about their job or their field and learn more about them to see if there's someone that you want to stay connected with, or maybe you want to do a job like that, or maybe you don't. And that's good information too. So thank you so much for clearing up that definition for everyone who's listening. Now, what advice do you have for those people who are feeling really anxious or scared or nervous about approaching this? Yeah. So first off, what you described, Jennifer, is really common. <laughs> so if you are feeling that, welcome. You're in really excellent company. I mean, I've been there and so many of my clients and the, and the PhDs that I interact with, grad students, PhDs, all of the above, uh, have experienced that. So it's totally normal, common. Uh, and I will say that those feelings uh, can be what prevent folks from taking the leap into doing informational interviews. Uh, so again, you're in really good company there. But I'm not answering your question directly, but I will say that once folks start doing informational interviews, it, it's like a light goes off. Everything changes. Um, it's really incredible. I think there's re so many different reasons for that, but I really encourage you to do it. And all you have, just take one step at a time. So this is not the only way to do it. This is not like the way that is necessarily going to be right for you. But for example, it could be that you decide to do one informational interview with a person that you already know and trust. Ooh. So maybe you don't talk 
you know, maybe they're from your personal life or family, or you work with them years ago. Uh, so you don't sort of know already everything about them in terms of their career and their job, but you know, there's some level of comfort and trust. So you say, okay, maybe you send them a text <laughs> or an email, Facebook message, whatever it is. Hey, can we have a chat about your job? Because I'm thinking about what I want to do next, and I'm confused about what some options are. Uh, you work as a project manager. That's something that intrigues me. Can we just like have a convo so I can learn more about that? So, you know, this is relatively low stakes. And that first step is important. And then you take another step after that, right? So this doesn't have to be this big, overwhelming kind of campaign that you go on. Just do it once and, and really send that one email, send that one message. That's a first step. Mm, that makes so sense. Just sending that first message and reaching out and maybe reaching out to someone who you already know, who you're already familiar with can be a really good idea for people who are feeling uncomfortable or nervous or anxious about that process. I love that idea. And I think that that would make it so much less anxiety provoking for me. Like, oh, you know, I do have people that I could reach out to you about that kind of thing. I, do, I can have a conversation with that friend that I haven't talked to in a few years. I'm sure they wouldn't be upset to hear about, you know, if they don't have time, that's okay. But like, I can reach out. That's, that's pretty low stakes for me. So I really like that. Um, now, when people are reaching out for the first time, is there something that holds them back from like actually reaching out? Is there something that's like preventing them from doing that step? Yeah. So, so I think kind of to generalize, I think that folks can get in their heads, <laughs> right? <laughs> shocking, right? Of course. Uh, and, and, and worry about things that are just way, way many steps in the future. And mm. so, I, you know, I always like to remind myself, you know, sometimes others is appropriate, like that is a later problem, right? So first off, don't get in your head too much. Um, I think what you said that if they don't respond, if they don't have time, like that's not personal, that's also a really important reminder, mm. right? Like you can send the email, whether they respond or not is not necessarily about you. Maybe they never checked LinkedIn. Maybe their, you know, parent just died. You don't know what's going on, right? Maybe they don't have any childcare in a pandemic, <laughs> right? Yeah. whatever, right? So, you know, decide not to take it personally. Um, I will say that when you send that first message, uh, your job is not done until you've sent a follow-up. I think that's really, really important advice. Uh, my inbox is a mess always, uh, <laughs> you know, DMS on Twitter or LinkedIn, there's no kind of way to like market is read or filing it in different folders. Like right. these things are just messy by nature. Uh, you know, not everyone is really skilled at managing their inbox. So I would, your job is not done until you've followed up if you need to. Um, I think that is such great advice. You know, I, I did this kind of workshop at the beginning of the pandemic that was all about how to stay connected during social distancing. And during that workshop, I really taught people that um, you have to assume that people are busy or that, that they're too, too swamped with things in their own life to hear you the first time. And that that follow-up is, is not just a courtesy for them, but for yourself, because you do want to be heard, right? Otherwise you probably wouldn't have reached out in the first place. Sending that follow-up up is a good thing to do for yourself as well as the people who are around you. And assuming that people might not have time or that their schedules might change is going to set you up for uh, not, not being disappointed. Uh, you know, just expect something to come up. And then if it does, you know, you can be flexible with it. Um, again, this is kind of a low stakes thing for you. You're reaching out and it's okay if they're too busy on the other end. Um, most of the time they'll tell you if they have the capacity to do so. Now, one thing that I want to be sure to ask about is like, can an informational interview help you get a job? Like, it, does that get me a job if I do those? Like, what, what is the correlation between informational interviews and careers? Oh, yes. What is the correlation? Yeah, that's a great question, right? So how are these two things connected? So I already said, you know, don't think of an informational interview as a, a way for you to ask for a job or pitch yourself uh, to an employer. Um but it does happen. So I think the outcome of informational interviews are unknown at the outset. And there I have heard the stories um, 
it's, these are true stories that sometimes uh, happen to folks where they do an informational interview and all of a sudden the person that they're interviewing says, uh, so, hey, <laughs> you want to join the team or there's an open position I think you'd be <laughs> great for or like hold up, something is coming through. I'll message you when that happens. This absolutely does happen. Um, and that can happen in your first informational interview or your 150th. I purposefully, that's a big number, I know. Um, so it definitely does happen. I would say you can be open to that, but that is probably not going to happen to you, especially I would say if you're switching sectors potentially. Okay. Um, but that doesn't mean there's no connection. So the connect, so learning really is important. Um, learning is important for you so that you can make better decisions about what you want, so that you have all of the more of the information, anyways, about what this you know job title is all about. Uh, what does this job ad actually mean? When right when it translated through an actual right. person who's doing it. Um, is this employer actually toxic, <laughs> right? Based on the job ad, you're not sure. You know, so the, <laughs> the learning piece is really important for you to make good decisions. Um, and then the learning piece also helps you craft stronger application materials because you get a sense from in communicating, interacting with that person uh, more about what that employer cares about care about, what that field is actually really about, what kind of stories they find compelling. So you can write better cover letters, uh, you can write better uh, uh, resumes, right, application materials. So these are kind of indirect connections. Um, and a lot of the times, you know, when folks are thinking kind of surface level, they will think, well, my informational interviews did not lead to a job. Yes, they didn't lead to a job directly. But then when you ask, so what was the value of informational interviews? Oh, well, I learned that there was a whole field I never heard about or this new company that, you know, was doing exactly what I wanted. Or there was this, this job title that I thought was totally something different, but actually was exactly what I was looking for. I mean, right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So indirect, very important. And frankly, they are very self-affirming for a lot of people. They boost Ooh. the confidence of people doing informational interviews. Um, you know, I'm not promising that, but that really is often um, an outcome, kind of an unanticipated bonus. Hmm. It, it is confidence boosting for a lot of people. It is affirming to have somebody like give you some of their time, to, you know, give you advice. That is a gift, right? It's a nice thing that they respect you. They take you seriously. They want to help you. Like, that's nice. Am I making sense? Sense, right like it's good oh, yeah. and that that helps your job search right oh yeah I think that that confidence thing is something you know if you're one of those people who's nervous or anxious about it and you know that not only doing this can help you with your career it can help you make better decisions it can help you network and meet more people but it can also boost your confidence by practicing more and reaching out to more people that you admire I mean that that's great. That is some incentive to actually try an informational interview if you've maybe been on the fence. So I love that. Yeah. And now you've got this new person kind of on your team. <laughs> That's great. Nice. And I love that idea. Like having someone on your team, well, it's kind of true. The more I learn about someone, the more I want to root for them, the more I want to cheer them on. And if I'm going to sit there and talk with someone for like half an hour, um, and that's in a way that's helping them. I'm also feeling like I have a little bit of a stake in their outcome. Like I want them to do well. And so I think that if you're feeling that anxiety, remembering that that's someone who's like trying to help you, who kind of wants to be on your team. So you can let them by reaching out. Um, I love that. Now, how do you find people to do informational interviews with? Like, how, how can people get started? Like, I know you said that you can reach out to like a friend or family member, but what about people you don't know? Yeah, so all of the above. Um, <laughs> uh, really everywhere. So some examples, um, in-person conferences, Sure. Right. Of course. You know, these, as someone uh, put it to me on Twitter today, you know, organic conversations, they said, you know, so after the, the panel, you know, in the hallway, whatever, right. Totally cool. Um, uh, so that's kind of from your professional life, people that you've worked with in the past, of course, uh, other professors in your department, uh, other grad students that, you know, have already graduated and gone off to work in industry. Right. So anybody that you've, that you've interacted with professionally um, over the years is fair game. Um, 
other places, social media. So LinkedIn is kind of an obvious one. Um, it's a great one. Uh, these people can be total strangers, but I think it's really helpful in terms of actually making the connection. If there, and by that, I mean, like actually having the conversation, right. <laughs> Not just sending the message, but right. uh, it's, it's helpful if there is some sort of connection already there. Um, you have a person in common, you went to the same undergraduate institution, et cetera. Um, of course, Twitter, people you follow, people that follow you back. Are you communicating in the same thread? Um, all of the above really matters. You can also just find people randomly online. Somebody uh, was on a YouTube channel, right? <laughs> Somebody uh, participated in a podcast. Somebody wrote a blog post that you admire. Like I did that for one of the folks I did an informational interview with 10 years ago, a woman who wrote a blog post about uh, Alt-Ac career transitions. And you know, I looked her up, she was in Toronto, I'm in Toronto. She had an English PhD. I'm a history PhD. I was like, well, there's some connections there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I sent her an email. And a few weeks later, I mean, I don't know how much later, but not so far into the future, we met in person. Oh, I love that. Now, I have, a, I have a question. So you said something a while back that was like zero, like for your first interview to like 150 interviews. How many info interviews have you done? Oh boy. I, I don't know. Um, it's a big number. <laughs> well, I, it, it, I probably haven't done that many. Um, and not all of the conversations I've had that are informational interview, like were seen in that light at the okay, time. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. Right. Like, so even might... though I was doing like the actions of informational interviews, it wasn't necessarily considered an informational interview at the time. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, if you think about networking, I think informational interview is a form of networking, but it's a mm -hmm. form of networking where you, as the person doing the interviewing, you can kind of, <sighs> doesn't always happen this way in reality, right. In the actual conversation, but you, all you need to do is prepare a list of questions and ask. Uh, so there's in that way, there is less kind of back and forth uh, versus networking more proper, if I can make that distinction, is really meant to be a real true back and forth where both parties are sharing. Now, I am not suggesting that in an informational, situa informational interview situation, you're not being helpful and there's no back and forth. Mm -hmm. Just I'm, if you're feeling nervous about it, remember, all you need to do is go in as a researcher, right? With a list of questions. <laughs> so I, I say that to hopefully take the pressure off. Um, yeah. So why did I say 150? Yeah. So there was a reason I picked that number. Um, a client that I had uh, last year um, over the summer and fall, now it's the summer again. So about a year ago, <laughs> she did 150 informational interviews. Wow. She told me this subsequently. Yeah. And it was, it, and you know, that was a choice that she made, you know, there's reasons why that suited her personality, why that suited her job search. Um, you know, we could talk more about that. Um, and the opportunities that she pursued came directly out of that and not mm -hmm. out of her applying to jobs. So she, the jobs that she ended up getting, she took a couple of part-time contracts with, with startups and small organizations. Um, wow. those, came directly out of informational interviews uh, and never uh, did she apply formally for a position, oh, right? That's now, amazing. that is one example. There yeah. are many, many examples, but that is one true <laughs> real life example. <laughs> oh, that's great. So 150 interviews helped that particular person because it matched their personality to do a lot of them and it helped them find the career path that they were interested in. So that's very cool. What if you're like, oh my God, 150 is nowhere near what I'm capable of. I can do like five. <laughs> yeah. Is that, yeah. is that something that's okay for people to start with? Yeah, I think five is a great number, you know, so there. So to let me talk about my process when I advise uh, PhDs mm. on the job search. Um, right. And when I say PhDs, I mean, people that have a PhD, people that don't have a PhD, but sort of, you know, relate <laughs> grad students, all of the above. Um, the process that I would recommend is first to kind of get right in your mind about what mm. is going on. So I call that prep. And then yeah. you go into focus. 
Um, and this, this focus section is you want to focus on yourself and that's basically self-reflection, mm-hmm. right? What do you want? What do you need, et cetera? What do you have already? Um, then, then the third step is identify. So identify some possibilities. And that's when you do research. And a big part of that research is probably going to be information interviews, but that's not the only type of research you're doing. Mm. So if you have limited capacity for informational interviews, at least right now, you can really emphasize the other types of research, but you're going to do it strategically. You're going to get your mind right. You're going to uh, focus on yourself. And then you're going to say, okay, based on what I've learned about myself, what are the types of jobs that I want to do some research on by reading job ads, by reading company websites, you know, by, you know, reading blogs, listening to podcasts, et cetera, um, uh, to learn more about whether these things would align with what I know about myself. Right. And then you'd be very selective. Okay. So it seems like I'll pick the example I used earlier. Project management is a role that is really going to suit me um, or uh, instructional designer. Let's say, you know, those are the two that I'm really thinking. I haven't really talked to anybody yet about them. So then, okay, let me go and talk to five people, maybe three for one and two for the other and see, you know, if I'm on the right track and maybe you are, maybe you're not right. Maybe you need to pivot a bit. Maybe you decide, well, it's not instructional designer. It's more, uh, you know, educational developer I'm going for, which is like slightly different, but right. Maybe at that point you decide you want to do more informational interviews, but the first five were really helpful in narrowing and pivoting. Does that make sense? That makes so much sense. I absolutely love that. And it sounds like having that process, having that kind of three-step approach really help people who are going through this. Can you tell me a little bit more about your program? I'm sure people who are listening want to hear about it because it might be right for them. Yeah. Thanks for asking. So let me finish the, the, oh, the yeah. steps here. So yeah, prep, focus, identify, right? That's where you really want to narrow down like, okay, this is what I'm going for. So project management, this person has decided and uh, educational developer, right? So um, then step four is market. I use that term purposefully market to employers. That's when you want to write your resume and worry about your LinkedIn profile or not, depending on your job search, et cetera. Right. Oh my gosh. I bet some people are really surprised right now. They're like, I thought I needed my resume first. Uh, oh. People, you really need this program because this is telling you that you might be putting your energy into the wrong places at the wrong time. Oh, I love that, Jen. It's yeah, exactly. And thank you for saying that. So I, I, <laughs> Do those things last, folks. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> and don't skip the earlier stuff. I mean, that's what I found. That's why I built it this way. So what is my program? So I have a PhD career clarity program. This is a paid program. Uh, it's 12 months access. That doesn't mean that it takes 12 months, but you've got 12 months because, you know, everyone's life is different yeah. uh, and job searches, uh, you know, can take time depending on you. Uh, it's 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 basically an online course, uh, self-paced. Uh, so, you know, you go at the pace you want uh, and it'll take you through all of those four steps from like, oh. I don't know if I even am ready to job search or want to all the way to interviewing for positions. Uh, And folks can learn more about that on my website from PhD to life dot com. Uh, um, The sales page, you can find it courses dot from PhD to life dot com. But let me say uh, if you're thinking about it or you're not even yet thinking about it, but you're curious, I do have a free training for PhDs and you can find that also on my website. Uh, I don't have a short kind of link for that, but that's you okay. Can find I'm going to drop the link below this <laughs> video in the description and it's going to be in the comment. So if you're even thinking that, you know, a program like that might be helpful for you, you wanted to get that group coaching and then be sure to sign up because that free workshop is going to give you more information about it. And it's going to tell you some of those myths that might be holding you back from really getting clarity on your, your career, what you want to do next. Um, this is your life, right? This is important. And it's a big decision um, to figure out what kind of path you want to go down. Uh, This is a great program that can help you get there. And I can vouch for that because my fiance needed this program to help him figure out his next steps. Um, He's been in it for months now and found it really helpful. So I encourage you to sign up for that free workshop. Again, the link is below here. Um, So be sure to sign up for that. Now, is there anything else about informational interviews that we should know about? Like, oh, oh, I have a good one. What's the good, what's like a really good informational interview question that I should add to that list? 
Yeah. So it's a what to ask in an informational interview. Um, kind of taking a step back from your question. <laughs> yeah. You know what to ask. You, you can Google the stuff and get like you know lots of different lists. Um, and you know there's value in that. You know, take take a quick scan of what people say. But ultimately, you want to sit down or you know stand up, whatever it is, lie down, um, <laughs> and go through. You know, what do you actually want to learn from this person? Mm-hmm. Like, what do you want to learn from them right now? And, and, you know, really do that introspection to decide what is most important. So, uh, and why do I say that? So I had a client a couple of years back and he came to me uh, and he had already done a bunch of informational interviews, like probably a dozen or two of Mm -hmm. them. And uh, he eh, eh, eh. (laughs) just wasn't working. And I was surprised, but it turned out, and this was his instinct site that he'd done informational interviews because that was um, a task that had been suggested to him as a thing that he needed to do. So he went out and did it, but he never actually really cared about the people and the career paths that he was learning about. He didn't care, right? So it was really just a rote exercise for him. Aha. Okay. Once he determined, well, actually, I really am interested in this. And this person is really cool because, right, that like additional energy and interest, then the informational interviews just were totally mind expanding. Right? Um, uh, why, what was your question? Remind me, because I was going what somewhere is a good with this question. Ah, yes. What is a good question to ask? So yeah, it really is going to depend, classic academic answer, <laughs> on what you really want to know. Um, but let me say that sometimes folks, I think there's a real uh, skill in asking questions, and you might not be as uh, skilled at it yet as you can become to be. Um, but one tip is that sometimes you might think, well, let, I'll just ask this person what their salary is, but you're like, that's kind of inappropriate, but I want to know like what I can expect to make. Aha. Well, then that's the question you want to ask. So instead of asking the person, how much money do you make? Or how much money did you make when you first entered this field? Right. Which is the first question a lot of folks think to ask. This is an example what do you actually want to know? How much money could I expect to make? What is a reasonable range for somebody with my background and experience pivoting into this role? Ooh, Does that make sense? That right? is a great question. And making it about yourself really helps take that kind of pressure off someone to talk about their own salary. And they exactly. may open up about it anyway. They may be totally fine talking about financial things, yeah. uh, but putting, putting the onus on you, like making it about yourself, um, it seems so much nicer. <laughs> I like yeah. that. I feel much more comfortable with that. And a similar piece of advice to that is sometimes you think, well, let me ask this person about something specific to them or specific to their team or employer, when actually what you really want to know is the trends in that sector or field in general. Right. Does that make sense? Right. So it's like, it's, I mean, maybe you do want to know about that company specifically, but typically, you know, you probably don't. So it's like, what are the parental leave provisions on your team? Well, actually what you really want to know is, what are the parental leave uh, trends that you're seeing in this industry in general? Oh, that is some next level thinking. I mean, I, I, I have been like dealing with my fiance doing informational interviews and like learning from all these people. And he, he's definitely getting some great insights, but thinking about the trends, thinking, thinking about like how it's affecting more than just the individual is a bigger approach. I mean, that is something that, I mean, wow, we're, we're all researchers, right? We've all, we've all done that in, in our work, but researching your field, researching what you want to do next is not something that people are always thinking about putting energy into, but it can really pay off. I, I just love that informational interviews can really help people um, experience some of that excitement, uh, be warned about some toxic workplaces. I mean, like get the information that they need to actually make decisions for themselves. So that's my favorite thing about it. Is there anything else you'd like to add about informational interviews before we wrap up? Let me repeat something I said earlier that 
this is a real sticking point for a lot of folks that they get stuck. Uh, and even folks in my program, <laughs> right? You know, I in the program, it's a self-paced online course, but I've got regular live small group uh, meetings over Zoom. And, you know, sometimes folks come and it's like, I, you know, I say this maybe a little nicer. Have you done informational interviews yet? And it's like, <laughs> no, not yet. I've skipped ahead. It's like... <laughs> Well, let's talk about that, right? Uh, don't skip this stage. Uh, you know, we could talk maybe, you know, there's different um, approaches, different strategies for every specific person, of course, and we can talk about that. But yeah, I think just do it. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so we can talk about why and how, et cetera, but ultimately just, just do some. Yeah. And if you do it, you can build some confidence. You can do some networking. You can really get comfortable talking about yourself and asking people questions. You can get better at asking questions. There sounds like so many benefits. It's kind of like, well, you definitely should be doing this, but also you're going to benefit from it too. Um, so thank you so much for talking with me today about all of this. Everyone who's listening, be sure to sign up for that free workshop from Jen. Uh, you don't want to miss that. Jen, how can people get in touch with you after the show? Yeah. Awesome. So, uh, I spend way too much time on Twitter. So <laughs> <laughs> if you're on Twitter, uh, I'm there. My handle is from PhD to life. That's all in words. Um, that's also my website from PhD to life.com. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Jennifer Pope, comma PhD. Uh, I'm happy to get messages there. I've also got a Facebook page from PhD to life. Uh, and you can email me Jen, J E N right. One N at from PhD to life.com. I'm happy to get your messages yeah. and follow up. If I ignore you, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Follow up. Be sure to follow up. Well, thank you so much for listening to this interview. Be sure to like the video and hit the subscribe button. So you don't miss the next one. Jen, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, you're welcome. It's always fun to chat. It'll be back in a year or two. Eh? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> no <great>. pressure. <laughs> that's right. <laughs>